joining us here today um, for the, uh, from the Y Zoominar. Um, we are recording this meeting um, and it'll be posted to uh, YouTube later for those um, who want to come back or um, didn't get the chance to join us here today. Um, so first off, uh, a few reminders. So the WISE meeting is going to be May 7th through 10th um, in Princeton, New Jersey. And WISE abstracts are due Friday, February 3rd. Uh, here is the uh, event website. Um, and I'll post that in the chat as well here in a minute. Um, so just a quick reminder about that. And then today to get started, uh, we've got two great uh, speakers. So our subject today is analysis of wave measurements. And our first speaker is John Lodis from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And he researches waves in extreme events. And today he's gonna be talking about global climatology of extratropical cyclones from a new tracking approach and associated wave heights from satellite radar altimeter. So I will stop sharing and let John take it away. I think I'm still sharing, sorry. Hit the wrong button. Oh, great. John, we can see your screen. Looks good, full screen. Yes, full screen. So take it away. All right, thank you for that introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so currently I'm working as a postdoc in CDIP or the Coastal Data Information Program. So I just wanted to give a quick introduction to that. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with these uh, wave rider buoys, our wave stations that are deployed all over the US coasts. Um, CDIP's main goal is to provide long records of high fidelity measurements to inform researchers and the US Army Corps. Uh, they work very hard to keep on top of the latest innovations of instrumentation, hardware, uh, field equipment, and new installation techniques. And they provide real-time data on their website to the larger community of anybody that wants to look at this data in their day-to-day -day life on their own CDIP website or with the partners of NOAA's uh, National Weather Service and NDPC. And some active research at CDEP happening right now uh, is research into extreme storm events, which is my area of study. Uh, some forecast analysis and validation going on, wave current interactions, and wind products from high frequency wave spectrum data. So today we're talking about extratropical cyclones. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna get a quick uh, introduction of how extratropical cyclones are different than tropical cyclones. Um, a quick <clears throat> uh, summary of why it's so difficult or how it's so difficult to model extreme waves and the difficulties associated with that. Uh, how we actually do our extratropical cyclone tracking. And then I'll be showing results of the extratropical cyclone climatology, seasonality, and the wave measurements that we've collected uh, within all of these extratropical cyclones. So first off, tropical cyclones versus extratropical cyclones. Uh, both are low pressure systems where you have uh, low of mean sea level pressure at the center. Uh, they have cyclonic winds, which is defined as counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. And tropical cyclones, otherwise known as hurricanes, uh, these are distinct in the fact that they only form over warm tropical waters and they're fueled by moist uh, air convection. Extratropical cyclones, on the other hand, form outside of the tropics, as their name might allude to. Uh, so they actually work to mix cold and warm air across fronts in the mid-latitudes. Uh, they're very baroclinic in nature, and they're fueled by this potential energy release across these strong boundaries. So they're much more horizontally fueled than vertically fueled as hurricanes can be. So some typical examples are blizzards, nor'easters, and mid-latitude cyclones. You might have heard them call these things before. And extratropical cyclones are special in the fact that they're just as hazardous as uh, tropical cyclones because they have very large stretches on the order of 1,000 kilometers. And they can create sea states that can propagate across entire ocean basins. And they really dominate the wave climatology in the mid-latitudes. 
So here's an example of a C-dip waves bulletin uh, that some of you might have seen before. Uh, but this is just a summary of some of the wave observations that were collected during one bomb cyclone nor'easter on the east coast of the US. And in blue on all these line plots are the observations from the buoys. And underneath is the model shown in red, the NOAA WaveWatch 3GFF model. And we can see in almost all of these locations, uh, the peak of the wave heights are missed by the model, which is something we see a lot in the wave modeling uh, output that we've compared our observations to. And except for this one right here, which is tucked inside uh, the Cape Cod hook. Uh, so that was sheltered from some of the largest waves. So that's why we don't see the peak in that one. Um, and if you look at tropical cyclones as well, uh, these are figures from Collins et al, who looked at a composite study of altimeter data within tropical cyclones. And all this data is rotated, binned and average, such that all the storm directions align. And you can see that the largest wave heights are always located directly to the right of the storm with regard to the direction of storm motion. And if you look at the bias from an operational wave hindcast, uh, you can see that as storms get stronger and stronger, you have more and more of a problem where the models are not properly representing the peak storm, uh, peak storm waves, um, and you end up with a large bias underneath the largest waves theme. So this shows a strong dependence on cyclone region, uh, speed and strength of how well the models are actually doing at representing these wave climates within these storms. So jumping on to extra tropical cyclones now. Um, tropical cyclones have a well-established database through NOAA, the National Hurricane Center, where you can go and find nice, neat storm tracks and a bunch of very useful data pertaining to each one of those storms. But for extra tropical cyclones, there is no well-defined system for this. So we had to kind of uh, go out and figure out our own. They're pretty difficult to track because they move quickly, they're asymmetric in shape, and they occur very frequently. Uh, just in this one visible satellite image, I can point out uh, maybe a dozen different storms just at one time step through their uh, signature comma-shaped cloud configuration. So you really need an automated tracker to track this many storms. So that's what I spent a lot of time working on when I first started my postdoc at CDIP. So the model that we use for the cyclone tracker is the ERA-5 reanalysis, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar from, from the ECMWF. Uh, it is a state-of-the-art global hindcast, provides atmospheric land and oceanic variables. Uh, the time period we're focusing on is 1979 to 2020. It has pretty high resolution for a global model, which is hourly and 0.25 degree spatial resolution. And it's got a bunch of great data simulation of in situ and remote observations. So primarily we're using the mean sea level pressure fields from the ERA-5 and the cyclones are identified using regional minimums in the mean sea level pressure fields to get all of the cyclone centers. So we've developed what I'm calling a grayscale image processing storm tracker. And what this tracker does is it takes a field of mean sea level pressure and actually converts it into a grayscale image, which then we perform the tracking on to find all of our low pressure systems. Uh, now, I'm not gonna go into all the details of this, but if you wanna learn more about how we are actually defining and uh, finding all of our storm centers, I encourage you to check out this JGR uh, publication on this work. Uh, but assuming we found all our low pressure systems, or low pressure centers, I should say. Um, we have to weed out some of them because not all low pressures are associated with extratropical cyclones, as you might have guessed. So the first thing we do is build storm tracks. So we connect cyclone centers in time if they occur within 160 kilometers of a cyclone center in the previous hourly time step. And this uh, 160 kilometer per hour is basically the upper limit of cyclone speed for these extratropical cyclones. 
And this eliminates weak and short-lived perturbations. And we also have the added uh, stipulation that cyclones must last for 24 hours and travel a minimum of 1,000 kilometers to make sure they stick around long enough to impact the wind field, uh, the wave field, sorry. And last, we want to exclude tropical cyclones in this study because we want to focus directly on extratropical cyclones. So we only consider cyclones that form outside of 25 degrees north or south. And once we do all this tracking over that 42 year period, uh, this is what we get. So we have a, a global data set of storm tracks. And here plotted, I'm also showing the minimum low pressure associated with each one of these storm centers. So we have a ton of data, a ton of storm tracks to play with. Um, so I'm gonna show you the climatology that came out of this storm track index. So here I'm showing the average, <clears throat> the annual average cyclone center density, uh, which just means I took all these cyclone centers that are part of a storm track, bin them all up and average them over the 42 years in one degree lat long bins. And you can see some nice hotspots start to jump out of where the cyclone activity is largest. So here breaking it down a little bit more, I'm showing uh, relative probability distributions over here on the right for the North Atlantic, uh, this should say, oh, sorry, North Atlantic, North Pacific and Southern Oceans. Here are the minimum pressure per storm. And also in these boxes, I'm showing the total number of storms tracked over the 42 year period. Uh, the maximum wind associated with each one of these storms and the joint, uh, joint distribution between the two of them. Um, so you can see as pressure decreases, you get stronger and stronger uh, wind forcing, which is expected in these storms. Uh, lastly, uh, so we know that Minimum pressure is a identifier of strength of these cyclones. So if you look at the Southern Ocean minimum pressures here, you can see that the distribution is heavily shifted towards lower uh, minimum pressures, showing that these storms are really uh, quite more intense than the storms that we see in the North Pacific and North Atlantic on average. So now we're going to dive into some seasonal trends. Uh, this is for the North Atlantic, the winter on the left-hand side, and the summer months on the right-hand side. The top plots are the average pressure center, which I said you could use to look at storm intensity. Uh, the middle plot is average intensification, uh, which is the change in pressure along each one of the storm tracks. So if the pressure is going down, this value is negative, and you see a strong region of storm intensification off the U.S. East Coast. Uh, during the winter months. And then on the bottom here, I'm showing average velocity of the storms, their translational movement uh, over the ocean. And you can see in the winter, the jet stream is pushing them very quickly from the east coast of the US towards Western Europe. And here I'm showing just the seasonal cycle of total count of storms seen in the Atlantic. So here I'm showing the same thing for the Pacific, and I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because the trends are very, very similar to what we see in the North Atlantic. Um, but you can see here in the seasonal counts that a few more storms happen over the year, um, about a hundred more on average in the North Pacific relative to the North Atlantic. And now in the Southern hemisphere, here you're looking at uh, the Southern hemisphere summer on the left and the sorry, Southern hemisphere winter on the left and the Northern hemisphere summer on the right. Uh, so you can see how intense of an environment the Southern ocean is with the circumpolar activity of extratropical cyclones uh, with enhanced strength in the winter, very strong uh, deepening or intensification almost around the entire uh, circumpolar area on average and strong velocities of these storms as well. And looking at the spar graph here, you can see how the numbers uh, of the total count of cyclones happening in the Southern Hemisphere really dwarf that happening in the North Atlantic or North Pacific. Um, about twice as many storms in the Southern Ocean than in the Northern Hemisphere combined, at least over ocean waters. 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about extratropical cyclones and the North Atlantic Oscillation. For a quick recap, the North Atlantic Oscillation is defined by the Icelandic low here and the Azores high. And in the positive phase, the jet stream goes right through here because we have a very strong low and a very strong high, and that shoots the jet stream straight through onto Western Europe. And in the uh, negative or what's called the blocking phase, you have weak low pressure and weak high pressure, and the jet stream uh, tends to meander up over Greenland and doesn't have the same impact as in the uh, positive phase. So looking at our storms, our uh, storm speed shown here at the top, the storm uh, density, storm center density again in the center, and the minimum pressure at the bottom here. Uh, we can see the storms are reaching further into Western Europe and the North Atlantic, very strong storm speeds uh, heading here across the basin and relatively strong uh, intensities, which you'll see even better once we compare them to the negative phase, where you see this blocking effect really show up with slower velocities moving across the North Atlantic, uh, a density of storms pushed back towards the East Coast of the US and Canada, and some of these uh, overall less intense uh, storm intensities, but also um, some increased intensity locally around the east coasts of Canada and the US again. So you see a, a pretty large shift of those storms and storm activity back towards the western half of the basin. So finally, I'm going to talk about some wave measurements underneath these extratropical cyclones. So one data set that we've really relied on a lot for looking at this uh, is significant wave height taken from satellite radar altimeter. Um, and this is done from the return signal from the altimeter back to the radar, uh, the waveform, you can actually get an empirical estimate for significant wave height uh, that has been vetted and validated um, to the point that we can use this confidently. So it has a low repeat resolution. Uh, these are just three weeks of satellite tracks from one satellite in particular. Um, but the great thing is it has really high along track resolution, uh, roughly seven kilometers at one hertz. And it's the only available data set uh, that has global coverage of the ocean. And they also measured 10 meter wind speeds in this way. So we can look at that and use some of the wave heights as well. So the next step is to actually take all this altimeter data and collect it within extratropical cyclones. So the full data set we're using is from the Rival and Young 2019 data set with 36 years of intercalibrated inter significant wave height data from 14 different satellite missions dating back to 1985. So we pull all the data that we find along these storm tracks within 500 kilometers and 0.5 hours of each cyclone center. And this is actually the same algorithm that Collins et al. developed for hurricane study uh, that I've developed a little bit further to be uh, accurately applied to the larger size of the extratropical cyclones. So here you can see a storm track progressing, and this is the type of altimeter tracks that we'll get going through our uh, interested domain around these storms. Cool. Check another chat. All right, I'll revisit the chat at the end. <laughs> so if we take all these altimeter data points within our cyclones and plot them up spatially and look at seasonal averages, we can see an extratropical cyclone climatology for the northern and southern hemisphere. And you see some nice uh, wave climate seasonality jump out um, as you expect with the climatology of the extratropical cyclones themselves. So here we're looking at average HF as uh, wind speeds increase within these storms. And you can see that as wind speeds increase, you get increasing uh, wave observations within these extratropical cyclones. And you see some hotspots of very large waves uh, around eight meters on average within these storms start to pop up. Um, especially around Western Europe, the poleward side of the 
extratropical domain of the Southern Ocean and in the North Pacific as well. Uh, similarly, we can look at cyclone speed and how cyclone speed uh, affects significant wave height in the same manner. Uh, so we see in these top four plots, uh, increasing significant wave height with increasing storm speed. So we see that storm speed has uh, a pretty big correlation with the size of the waves themselves, which is a similar trend seen in tropical cyclones. And here in the bottom here, I'm showing some distributions of latitude and translational speed of the storms. So you can see in the Atlantic and the Southern Oceans, the storms tend to travel the fastest uh, around the mid-latitudes, 40 to 60 uh, degrees north or south. And the Pacific has an interesting distribution uh, because of the land masses in the Northern Pacific that actually uh, halt a lot of the movement of these storms uh, around 70 degrees north. So just like we looked at the wave, the extratropical cyclone uh, climatology, we can now look at the wave climatology within extratropical cyclones according to the uh, NAO positive and negative phases. So just as with the storms themselves, we see during the positive phase, more high waves uh, affecting Western Europe and Iceland. And in the negative phase, we see those larger wave heights backing off from the Western of Europe shift back towards the East Coast of the US and Canada. So another thing we could do, uh, this is similar to what Collins et al did, is you bin all the data and rotate it such that you're in a uh, cyclone-centered reference frame and all the storm directions align. And then you could look at uh, spatially dependent or storm region dependent wave heights. So on the top plot here, I'm showing this for the Northern hemisphere, the North Atlantic and North Pacific combined. And I'm just showing these arrows to show that this is the general circulation pattern within these cyclones. And you see the strongest winds uh, show up directly to the right of the wind speed, or sorry, the storm direction, uh, as was seen in hurricanes from Collins et al. Um, and the max of significant wave height within these storms is seen in the similar region. Uh, but now if you look in the Southern hemisphere, this relationship is flipped because the Coriolis force goes the opposite direction. So you have uh, clockwise flow in the Southern hemisphere and the strongest winds and waves are seen to the left of the storm motion. So if you take this uh, <clears throat> uh, relationship of the maximum waves, maximum wave heights in these cyclone centered reference frames and look at the deep cyclones in each ocean basin. Uh, so here I'm defining a deep cyclone or a very strong cyclone as a minimum pressure with less than 980 millibars as its minimum pressure for the North Atlantic and North Pacific. And in the Southern hemisphere, I've taken this down to 960 just because the Southern hemisphere uh, has a lot more storms centered around 970 uh, millibars or hectopascals as its center. So if you use your imagination a bit and superimpose these two plots uh, with the arrows in the same direction as the arrows on these translational velocity plots, uh, you can start to see why these deep cyclone HSs start to line up on the south and uh, eastern side of these basins in the north, uh, northern hemisphere and how in the Southern Hemisphere, this relationship is actually flipped because uh, cyclones will travel in this orientation with their left side uh, with respect to motion producing the largest waves. So now we can do a little bit of a hindcast comparison to some wave buoy data. Uh, the wave information study with hindcast is developed by the US Army Corps of Engineers using the Wave Watch 3 model and wind fields produced by Ocean Weather Inc, uh, which <clears throat> employs some enhanced wind fields uh, with in-situ and satellite data simulation and special treatment of some tropical and extra-tropical systems. And the great thing is they output data directly at these CDIP buoy locations. 
Um, so here I've taken storm tracks that pass within 500 kilometers of each one of these uh, three CDIP buoy locations. And I've pulled all the significant wave height data from the buoy and from the WIS hindcast so that we can do a one-to-one -one comparison of the two. Um, and we see at very large wave heights that the model is underestimating uh, the actual significant wave heights seen at the buoy location. So again, missing the peak of HF. And just showing this again as a QQ plot, a quantile quantile plot, you can see at the larger quantiles, uh, you get that same under prediction start to show up in each one of these buoys. Uh, so last, we're gonna talk about a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about the mini wave buoy data array that I've also been looking at. Um, so similar to AltWiz, which was the algorithm used to pull altimeter data along the storm tracks, I've written some code to pull buoy data in the same fashion uh, within 500 kilometers and 0.5 hours of the cyclone centers. And we can start to investigate all this wave data at the same time. So the background field I'm showing here is the ERA-5 significant wave height uh, outputted from their WAM model. Uh, it's the model used in the ERA-5 reanalysis. And you see the buoy data start to pop up and the altimeter tracks going across at the same time. I'm going to try to play this one more time. <clears throat> and what I'm trying to point out here is the buoys and data itself um, unsurprisingly shows more variation than the model does. Um, and you could say that's a factor of model resolution. Uh, but here I'm pointing out that the model resolution is actually 0.5 degree. And for context, these wind uh, vectors are 0.25 degree. So the wave model is a little bit more coarse, but you can see that there exists uh, gradients <clears throat> and more variability in the wave heights uh, on scales that should be able to be picked up by the ERA-5 uh, wave field. Um, so this incorrect uh, gradient of waves and under prediction uh, could have big effects when you're looking at something like uh, vertical mixing induced at the surface from um, large and breaking waves, uh, which could have impacts for larger circulation ocean models and climate models and things like that. So just in summary, um, <clears throat> extratropical cyclones are very abundant and important to our wave planet. On average, uh, we globally tracked around 2,800 2, cyclones per year, just extratropical cyclones. Um, so they dominate the wave climate in the mid-latitudes. Again, they can create very extreme sea states that propagate across the entire ocean. And these storm and wave climatology from uh, what I've shown is linked to different climate modes like NAO and likely others as well. And this underprediction of HS by wave models um, has been seen in extratropical cyclones. We're going to continue to document this um, much in the same way that has been done with hurricanes. And this has real impacts for real time forecasts, uh, for shoreline impacts and marine hazards. And like I alluded to before, mixing in the upper ocean. Um, when you have models and parameterizations that uh, take wave height into account. Uh, so my last remarks, um, this publication at JGR Oceans, you could also find all of the storm tracks that were actually used uh, in the study. They are publicly available. Um, and if anybody has any interest in using those and would like to chat about them, um, more than welcome to reach out. And our next steps of study is going to be comparing these altimeter measurements of wind speed and significant wave height to model output, looking at that in a storm reference frame, much in the way Collins did with uh, tropical cyclones. Try and highlight some additional avenues for model improvement. Uh, there seems to be a fruitful path to look at more climate oscillation studies and extratropical cyclone and wave climate. Um, keep investigating those HS gradients um, within extratropical cyclones and how that might uh, translate to vertical mixing and try and tie all the cyclone activity into coastal erosion and shoreline impacts. 
And that's all I have. Thank you guys for listening. All right, thank you, John. And we are right at the 30 minute mark. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start to switch speakers. Um, but if you have a quick question um, or if you wanna address the chat while uh, Ali gets her screen loaded up, we can do that. Um, and I'm gonna send the quick reminder that I prompt the email or the website earlier. Um, All right, um, no, no quick, okay, great. So we've got some questions in the chat. So John, I'll uh, encourage you to answer those there. And if you could stop sharing your screen, we can get Ali's, uh, let her share her screen. I'm frozen. I don't know if you could hear me. Ah, we can hear you now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, unfortunately we don't have time for questions right now. We do have a couple in um, the chat. Uh, so yeah, I sorry. Answer those My computer there. is completely froze at the second. So if you can move on, <laughs> please go ahead. I can, I can try and override you, John. Let's see. Does that work out? Uh, it's not looking. Let me see. Going to try and quit and rejoin. There we go. Or, okay, so I, I could select um, to view your screen. Um, so uh, Ali Ho is a PhD candidate at Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography. Her research is focused on using observations to study uh, wave modulation by underlying tides and bathymetry, wave current and extreme weather and impacts on the shoreline communities. And today she's gonna be talking to us um, let me make sure I read the correct uh, title here. Um, wave tight interactions for a strongly modulated wave field. And so Ali, please take it away. Thank you so much. Great, great. Okay, you can see my screen and everything it worked out. I had to select, um, so others might also have to select um, on the view options to share your, or to view your screen instead of John's. Oh, sure. okay. um, although I think he just dropped off so I've just been in the way. Okay, great. We can see your screen. Um, so okay, go ahead. Perfect. Great. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Ali. I'm a graduate student at Scripps. Um, and I'm excited today to present some work published recently in collaboration with my co-authors, Sophia Merrifield and Nick Pizzo, on wave tight interaction for a strongly modulated wave field. Um, particularly as um, John nicely introduced CDIP, we're using kind of these observations from the seat at buoy here in question to kind of explore this question. So um, to, as a brief overview of this talk, uh, when I say wave tide interaction, I'm speaking about the influence of tidal currents and water level variations on waves. And wave tide interactions can really strongly influence nearshore surface wave variability, which is of big importance, obviously, to coastal communities, maritime safety, and coastal engineering and planning. However, these interactions are not often resolved in operational wave forecasts due to the computational costs associated with running wave models with both currents and tides. Um, and existing theories of wave current interaction have been limited, limited in certain cases for understanding particular observations. And so in this talk, I'll be presenting some such observations of really strong tidal modulations in near shore wave fields and offer ex an explanation for that behavior by assuming that the tide is actually modulating the surface waves through what is essentially a long wave short wave interaction. And so kind of zooming out, you know, wave current interaction when we speak of it is really a truly multi-scale problem. Um, the surface gravity waves, which we're more familiar with are in the grand scheme of, you know, ocean processes are re relatively smaller scale phenomena, but they're interacting with a wide variety of scales of features from, you know, the large boundary currents like the Gulf Stream and the Nagulis, um, and extratropical cyclones, but also, you know, mesoscale and sub, sub, sub mesoscale features such as grunts, wakes, eddies, and internal waves. And in particular for my work, I'm seeking to tie together two different scales by examining the way that surface waves are influenced by tides. And tides will also technically surface waves operate on much larger scales, you know, oscillating every 12 to 24 hours and propagating around entire ocean basins within that time. 
Historically, tides have been observed to lead to really significant changes to surface waves. Um, in the literature, two examples are shown here below. Uh, one on the left is a time series of significant wave height from Pullman 1990 that found you know, variations of up to 50% in waves in the North Sea due to tidal currents. And on the right, a more recent paper by Wang and Shang that found really significant energy in wave heights at exactly the M2 tidal frequency for a range of um, buoys at a range of depths in the Gulf of Maine. And the typical approach to explaining um, wave tide interaction is to treat, you know, the it as a wave current interaction problem between those surface waves and those tidally induced currents. And the steady kind of textbook example of wave current interaction gives us that when waves are instant on uh, an opposing current, um, they will become Doppler shifted and increase in wave height um, and frequency follow from them being Doppler shifted. However, um, other, other observations actually have actually found circumstances where we see wave heights increasing on both the following and the opposing tidal current. You know, as tides create both um, an unsteady and inhomogeneous medium that the waves are propagating in, uh, attempts to find a clear, simplified relationship between the way that surface waves are modulated and the phase of the tide becomes uh, more complicated when seeking um, a simplified framework to understand this. And so, in this talk, I'll demonstrate how we've been working to develop an understanding of tidal influences on surface waves, really motivated by the set of observations we're looking at here. This data is from the Fernandina Beach uh, CDIP station, um, located uh, off the coast of Florida in about 60 meter water depth, um, and is operated by the Coastal Data Information Program. This buoy, where we can see the time series of significant wave height and then the time series of the spectrogram for a couple weeks, um, is uh, from a data well Mark IV, so we also conveniently have measured surface currents from the acoustic transducer on the whole. And we see what we initially saw when looking at this data is that we're seeing these kind of like higher, finer scale modulations to, to the wave field. Um, we can see it very clearly in the significant wave height, you know, every kind of little oscillation that's happening here uh, moves up and down every 12.4 hours at that M2 tidal frequency and is really apparent also in, in the wave spectrogram. And I'll go into these observations in detail in a second, but one last thing to take note of here is that the, the wave forecast run at this buoy at this location, uh, shown here in red, isn't picking up any of those finer scale modulations due to the fact that running forecasts uh, with tides and currents is um, computationally expensive. And so that modulation that we're seeing in that time series is at exactly that M2 tidal frequency, which we can determine from you know, spectral analysis of those bulk parameters. And we're seeing that peak at 12.4 at, uh, hours, uh, both in the significant wave height, the peak period, and in the directional spread. Um, this is ind indicative of a wave current interaction as you know, the currents will modulate both the energy and the vector wave number of the surface waves. So going back and taking a closer look at the observations, we have seen how um, the oscillation really occurs around this energetic uh, red swell band at around 10 seconds, um, you know, shifting it up and down. We originally, when we were first looking at it, this, just called it a wiggle because that's what it looked like and we couldn't really find any other explanation for it. Um, and that shift corresponds particularly for instances that where we, when we see the wave period increases is when we see the significant wave height decreases. Um, which is, you know, consistent with that conservation of wave action and demonstrates a periodic steepening and de-steepening of that wave field. And so, as you discussed, you know, when you, you'd expect that when you see an increase in steepness um, associated with currents, you'd expect that you would see kind of the, the steady example where waves incident on an opposing current will effectively steepen the wave field. However, based on the, the measurements uh, at the buoy, we can actually see that the opposite is the case. Um, and we see that the waves are actually steepening on the following current rather than the opposing current. This is consistent um, for kind of the whole time record that we're seeing and also consistent um, with the, the one dimensional spectrum as we're showing here. Um, here I'm plotting the 1D spectrum for about 12 hours um, and coloring each spectrum by the current measured at that time. So the blue colors indicate um, instances where the current was in the same direction following the wave, uh, the wave oh. direction. Um, and mm -hmm. the, sorry, I can hear someone else on the background. Um, and the red colors indicate uh, instances where the waves are opposing um, the wave direction or the currents opposing the wave direction. And we see this consistent picture once again, where you know, the opposing current is downshifting that whole spectrum 
both in energy and in frequency and vice versa for the following, um, for the following current. And just to contextualize this again with that steady example of wave current interaction, this red and blue line indicate that expected shift from a Doppler shifting effect, which we can see is not only not picking up the correct shift in, in the sign and the amplitude, but also completely underestimates the, the magnitude of changes that we're seeing in both energy and in frequency. So at this point, we, we realized that our intuition from you know, the steady wave current interaction was limited in understanding what we were seeing at Fernandina Beach. So to guide our effort going forward, we knew that we wanted to answer you know, the following basic questions about the Fernandina Beach wave field. Namely, what, how, did the wave, how does the wave field uh, change as a function of the phase of the tide? And why were we seeing waves steepening on the following currents? Which frequencies were most affected and why did it seem like that swell band was the most modulated? And finally, did directional effects matter to, to, these, to, the, to these behaviors? And so typically to stu study these complicated you know, near shore wave environments, uh, third generation numerical models are used to model and forecast that observed behavior, which really works great to resolve the real world um, observations, but obviously comes with computational costs. And because we are interested in such a specific relationship between the tide and the surface waves, we decided to look for more simplistic solutions that would not only reduce computational needs, but also help us build intuition towards the underlying phenomena. And so to do so, we chose to really isolate our efforts and really model only the interaction between the tide and the surface wave. Um, and, this, and through this, we took two, spe two specific approaches, but both are similar in that they both use you know, simplified solutions to geometric optics and conservation of wave action and take the key underlying assumption, which is that we assume that the tide itself is acting as a progressive monochromatic shallow water wave. And to this end, we're now really modeling the interaction between that long tidal wave and those short surface waves um, on top of them. And I'll, be, I'll briefly describe those two approaches that we took right now. And then after that, go into some of the implications of the simplified models that we'll set, we'll set up. So the first approach that we took follows the framework set up by Tolman in 1990, where we begin with the governing equations for wave action and geometric optics. Um, and take two simplifications. Namely, we first ignore the right-hand side uh, of the conservation of wave action. So we're ignoring you know, all effects from wind, dissipation, wave-wave interaction. So we're only examining the response to current and depth-induced shifts. And then secondly, we're assuming that the tide acts as a wave. And so therefore the subsequent induced currents and water level variations can be explained as a function of the tide's phase. So with this, we're able to reduce the dependence um, on space and time of the currents and the water level variations to a function of a single variable, the tidal phase, chi. This really simplifies the governing equations and reduces the complexity as we're uh, no longer solving a system of PDEs. In addition to this, we can also identify the important terms that kind of arise from these uh, modified governing equations. Namely here, we see that both, both are gonna be modified by this CT minus CW term, which is the difference between the tidal phase and surface wave propagation spe speeds, which we'll come back to later. And so despite the benefits to this approach, we realized that we still needed to numerically solve the ODEs, which became more of an issue when we wanted to look at two dimensional effects. <laughs> All right, and we still found um, you know, difficulty understanding the exact mechanisms for why we were observing waves increasing on following currents. And so as we were working, we realized that by assuming that the tide was a wave, there was actually another way to simplify this problem, which was by treating um, the wave tide interaction as a long wave short wave interaction. You know, long wave short wave interaction has really been heavily studied and particularly the body of literature surrounding remote sensing as well as in the internal wave and surface wave interaction literature, which we draw the second approach from this body of work. <laughs> um, so in the likes of you know, Phillips, um, Hughes and Eleni and Pizzo, uh, they have demonstrated that if we work in the reference frame, um, moving with the internal wave at the phase speed CT, then, <laughs> sorry, the absolute, 
uh, frequency in this reference frame no longer varies in time, which allows us to reduce um, the problem that we set up to a system of algebraic equations. This has helped give light to these questions for why there are these you know, periodic bands of roughness on the ocean surface caused by internal waves. And the key question to this approach is what you take um, that speed of that reference frame to be. For the case of the internal waves, um, where their phase velocity is relatively slow in compared to the surface wave propagation speeds, you know, up to a couple meters per second. Um, in this case, the opposing currents on, on the on the trough of the wave field will still lead to that steepening of the surface wave field. However, when we want to apply um, this approach to the case of the tide, the question is, what do we use as that phase speed for our long tide wave? So, as we have been treating the tide as a monochromatic shallow surface wave, we can set its velocity at square root gh. In this case, there can now be circumstances actually where the tide is propagating faster than any of the surface waves in question. And so now in that reference frame, moving really fast with that long tidal wave, these slower surface waves appear to be propagating backwards. We find now that that same following current is now leading to the opposite sign in modulation towards the surface waves. And clearly there's this really strong dependence on the choice of the phase speed of the long wave reference frame versus the propagation speed of the surface waves. And if you recall, this is reminiscent to what we, what we found from that first numerical approach, where we, we found this relationship um, towards this CT minus CW term. And we can see based on this, that um, when the long wave phase speed CT is either greater or less than that propagation speed of the surface wave CW, um, the modulation towards surface wave action will change its overall sign, which is what we think we're seeing at Brandina Beach. And so to demonstrate that, I want to walk through a really simple 1D example with the simplified framework that we've set up. The model works as such that, you know, given an initial condition and setting the forcing terms, which are the currents and the water level variations, we can estimate the change in the wave spectrum. Here we begin with a simple John Swap wave spectrum with a peak at about 10 seconds. Um, and in this case, we're assuming that everything's propagating either in the same direction or opposing, so we're not dealing with any directional effects. The last choice to make is the choice of that speed of that long wave. And so if we begin with the example when the speed of the long wave is much slower than that of the surface waves, i.e. Where, where there's either, either no wave-like nature in the forcing terms or the long waves have very slow phase speeds, such as in the case with internal waves, but we see that we resolve that expected behavior where the wave spectra is increasing on the opposing current and then decreasing on the following current. If we now applying this to the case where we set the long speed of the long wave to mimic that of the tide, where it's now much faster than that of the surface waves in question, we see an entirely different response to the wave spectrum. Now that opposing current leads to a decrease in energy and frequency, and it's the following current that now amplifies the wave spectrum. And note that there is, uh, I didn't change the magnitude of the currents at all in this case. The only thing that changed was that speed of the long wave, and that we're noticing a much stronger amplification to that wave spectrum for those exact same forcing terms. In addition, we're seeing that the low frequency part of the spectrum is much more modulated than the higher frequencies, which is opposite that behavior from that simple case and much more similar to the observations at Fernandina Beach, both in the change in magnitude and um, in, in the direction of change. Instead of using you know, a stimulated 1D spectrum, we can also compare um, this, this simplified model directly to the observations. We can use um, the observations of the omnidirectional spectrum to initialize the model and then compare the predicted shift to the observations. As shown in this plot here, we're looking at the at um, two uh, of the wave spectrum pulled out. Um, the observations are shown in, in the dashed line for the opposing current in the red and then the following current in the blue. And the model in the solid line matches well to, to that shift in the, in the spectrum. The corresponding model wave spectrum from, from that prediction shown here in this lower plot is really now able to mimic the, the shape and variations of that observed spectrum that we saw over here about two cycles of the semi internal tide. And that also, that simplified tidal model now also leads to the change, um, the observed changes in the bulk parameters 
that were modulating in phase according to those changes in water levels and currents. And on average, we're seeing um, variations from uh, 15 to 20 percent in both the peak period and um, in significant wave height, which is mimicked by the, the simplified model. So this numerical framework that we have demonstrated at Fernandina Beach here um, can also be expanded to characterize wave variation in other nearshore environments. As what we've realized with this work is that this is an, not an isolated phenomena. There is evidence of kind of this interaction, not just at Fernandina Beach, but um, at numerous other um, uh, buoy locations, uh, as shown here in St. Augustine in Florida, as well as Thimble Shoals in Virginia. And with the simplified framework, we can now hope to identify, you know, nearshore wave environments that are either more or less prone to tidal modulations, with the overall goal of developing global estimates of surface wave variations due to the tides. And so in conclusion, we've presented an explanation for tidal modulation in surface waves in order to explain observations at Fernandina Beach, with a couple of notable takeaways being that um, things will be more or less prone to these tidal modulations, obviously when they're amplified uh, currents, but also when you have kind of the right relationship between the speed of the long wave and that speed of those short surface waves. And with that, we're able to predict the change in omnidirectional wave spectra due to the tide observed at Fernandina Beach. Like we said, future work will, will characterize this and look at this interaction in other locations um, and explore you know, this behavior numerically in, in other extreme environments. And with that, I'd really love to take any questions. Um, all the other kind of finer details um, can be found in our paper, which is out in, on early release in Journal of Physical Oceanography. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions also over email. And with that, thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Ali. And it looks like we already have Hendrik with a hand up for a question. Yeah, go for it. Hendrik, you are still muted if you are speaking. Yeah, is this better? Yes. All right, so hey, Ali, thank you for making me feel old by reference my first <laughs> journal publication ever 33 years ago. Uh, very, very interesting. I, I hope you come to WISE. I hope I have some time to talk to you about all this stuff. Uh, the, the real, uh, the, the, the quick question, uh, since you're really looking at, at, the, uh, at exactly the opposite from what people are always looking at, uh, mm -hmm. where people always look at the crazy steady currents. Uh, did, did you look at um, uh, Barber's observations uh, in 1948 in the Bristol Channel? And does that have a yeah. similar wave height modulation like you show? Yeah, I find, um, yeah, that was uh, kind of one of the fun things to look at. Some of these are like really old historical observations like from Barber's. Um, and I think it was, it's hard to tell because it's certain kind of studies that study the interaction right between these tidal modulations and surface waves only have water level variations measured. But I think if you're assuming kind of the typical relationship at Barber's point where you have the following currents um, on the crest, I think it looked like you, it was um, a similar case there. Um, but yeah, that, there, there has been, yeah, like a couple of really interesting previous works. Um, kind of yeah, like that really, really cool. Uh, I think it's really yeah. cool that you're looking at this outside of the framework that everybody looks into it with the quasi stationary situations. Having yeah. said that, a lot, of, a lot of the coastal places where we're looking at you really have to look at you really have to look at the whole picture because even if the currents are from a tide in coastal areas they're very often bathymetry driven so they actually become yeah. quasi quasi stationary becomes dominant over the over the time fluctuation but yeah lovely work i hope to talk to you and wise about this more thanks yeah no thank you for your question yeah we we're definitely um one that was one of the things that was kind of nice about Fernandina beach is that there wasn't a lot of influence um from like kind of more interesting bathymetry but I think uh, it is kind of like an interesting problem when you think about kind of the way that the tide is modulated in these nearshore environments. Um, but yeah, thanks so much. You're still relevant, yeah, if that gives you any. <laughs> All right, uh, next question. We've got a hand raised from Trig. Apologies. Yes. Yeah, put your no, that's me. Yeah. That's too good. Okay. Thanks for a very interesting, uh, interesting presentation. Very interesting topic. I read your. Preprint is very, very nice, uh, very nice piece of work. Because I was just curious, 
related to what mm -hmm. Henrik said, uh, did you investigate the horizontal gradients in the currents and, and looked at how, how they were in the area? Yeah, I th one of the things about um, this framework that we have set up, we're only looking at kind of the kind of uh, instantaneous kind of response at a, at a single point. So with this approach, we're not really able to kind of look at the full field of, of wave height variations, um, which is something that I think we're very interested in looking at how, you know, you know, uh, spatial gradients in the wave field can then propagate and affect with when you add on top of these kind of temporal variations as well. I don't have a good answer for you, but but it is something no, that we're really we we had in. a we had the publication in 2021, I think, uh, in mm -hmm. in a tidal current in northern Norway in JPO, where we also looked at we this very simplified model on looking at the, the horizontal current gradients and how it uh, how it entered the, the wave energy balance equation. But um, but thanks for I hope hope to discuss more at at points. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Talk. Thanks. All right, Ali, uh, we've got a comment from Lucy Wyatt in the chat um, that about the HF radar, uh, which I'll let you read later. And then uh, Fabrice. Yes, hi, Ali, very nice to, to see the, the result of, of that work. Um, uh, thank you. I was wondering if you, if to get your solution, are you assuming that the solution is, is periodic? And I'm asking that because uh, some time ago, I looked at that with Schalper and other people, mm -hmm. and we ended up with solutions that were not periodic. I was wondering if that was was something you have to make or or not. Um, we're not assuming that the solution is periodic, but I mean we are assuming that the the kind of like all the forcing terms are periodic. I guess in the in the one approach where you're solving everything as a solution of this periodic you know phase chi of the tidal um, phase, that I guess implies that the solution is going to be periodic. But in the in the other case where we're working in the reference term over tide, it's not necessarily an inherent assumption. Okay, but I think like the what because for this kind of very simple setup that we have because all of the kind of forcing effects are periodic, then all the solutions are periodic. I think that is probably well, going to be changing. The case. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, when I, you I read the paper, so maybe uh, uh, there's something obvious. That's uh, okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. All right. Um, I don't see any new hands raised. Give everybody a couple more seconds here for that burning question. And thank you, John, for addressing the questions from earlier in the chat. And not hearing anything, we will uh, thank our speakers once again. Uh, thank you to John and Ali uh, for those great talks and uh, watch out for your email for uh, advertisements about the next uh, seminar. And Ton, anything else before we wrap up? No, I think that's it for today. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye.